Um, uh, tut let's see you have to a gonna teddy I a hat. Um, they call me Tutletzin, uh, which was my grandmother's uh, Klinkit name, and I'm from the Ganach Teddy clan, uh, which is one of the Klinkit clans on the Raven Moiti here in the Yukon, who is actually um, um, my esteemed colleague and personal friend, Justin Furby, as well, uh, from the same clan. And um, I received a second name this past um, uh, Saturday along with my grandson and my daughter um, and I haven't it was a surprise to me but in essentially it was a support um, to Clinkett uh, people um, associated with the sea lion um, uh, Clinkett story so uh, Tan E.G. Eat um, is the one where people where the sea lions sit um, and my grandson received uh, a clinket name, which means, uh, which is uh, Tek Kasani. It's the little pebbles that go into the, the belly of the sea lion to give them strength and weight them when they sit on top of that rock. And my daughter received a clinket name, a Ton Claw, which is the mother of sea lions. So culture is very important. Um, to us here in the Yukon First Nation, which we'll touch on a little bit. But before I get into my presentation, I just want to acknowledge the prayer uh, and the song that was provided um, by our esteemed elder uh, from the Northwest Territories. Um, I visited and lived in the Northwest Territories from 1986 to 1989 and worked with the Inuvi Alouette, so that was uh, very familiar to me. Uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, Nadia Joe, whose father um, is one of my mentors that I've been working with for over two decades, and he is one of the architects of our final and self-government agreements in our negotiations. I want to thank Action Canada for giving me an opportunity to be part of uh, this really important conversation, and I also want to acknowledge um, the confidence that my friend Justin has uh, provided in me in trying to move a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but realizing that the discussion around economic uh, reconciliation is very much aligned with a lot of the work that I've been doing over the course of the last two decades, uh, primarily in the implementation of our final and self-government agreements. I want to just extend an appreciation to all of you. It's like being back in the law classroom. I was watching you guys move through the desks and, and sharing sp um, space in that, and it, it took me back to that time 25 years ago when I was in law school. <laughs> and so, but I am very thrilled to be amongst um, change makers and thinkers and policy makers. And so I hope that what I have to share with you today based on my experience and perspectives uh, is something that you can take away. There's gonna be aspects of this presentation. I appreciate that some of you, uh, if not all of you, visited Carcross and some of the information might be familiar based on the discussion you might have had in terms of a backdrop to our land claims process. And I just wanna Give a shout out to some of my local girls. I see you guys in the audience, and so I hope uh, uh, you don't challenge me too much in the question area. <laughs> I want to acknowledge Shelby for one of the trustees that I work with, uh, Yukon First Nation Trust, which we're going to touch on in this presentation, as well as Sarah, who I sat across the table on some of the negotiations, and others who've worked with similar clients um, as myself. So, slide one, please. So, when I was first presented with uh, this opportunity to think about economic reconciliation, um, it was tough. Um, and, uh, you know, because uh, for some time now in this country, we've been talking about reconciliation as a result of the, recommend, you know, the, the calls to action that have come through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, through the directives that have come through Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Federal Strategy, and more close to home, the Yukon Strategy. And so recently I did some work for AF and Yukon and uh, Canada when they were reaching out to the respective regions and looking for insight on the implementation of that federal piece of legislation. So as is fitting, reconciliation is that it requires action. So we know that it's deeply complex because of our history, where we find ourselves in today's society, 
and where we want to go collectively. So when we think about reconciliation in the context of a Yukon First Nation perspective, uh, one of the uh, lenses that we look to reconciliation is our self-government agreements and our final agreements. As one part of finding that pathway towards reconciliation. In the work that we do in implementation, is, is that it's intended to address those historical injustices, not to repeat them going forward, but to learn from them, and looking at how we can, in fact, realize those objectives of reconciliation, which in large part in the Yukon context is about the empowerment of our people, about equity, uh, fairness for us to be able to participate in resource development, in um, opportunities that impact our lands and our resources, and to be able to participate in the design and the delivery of those developments and initiatives around us so that we can coexist as a society that's built on respect and uh, reflection on our history. Ultimately, um, you know, when I was looking at um, economic rec reconciliation, we think about economics sort of, for me, in sort of one channel, it's like about making money, wealth, uh, stimulation. Uh, but there, as I go through this presentation, you'll come to appreciate there, we have all of the um, requirements to, as Yukon First Nations, to achieve all of that. But there's also some economic gaps that we need to talk about uh, that are very necessary in order for us to achieve economic reconciliation for First Nations in the Yukon, to achieve Indigenous prosperity. Next slide, please. So some of this might be familiar to you. Um, there's 482,000 square kilometers in the Yukon, 43,000 residents, and approximately of those residents, 28,000 live in the city of uh, the Yukon. I should say that I am a Kwanlun Dun citizen, for those of you who don't know me. So uh, Kwanlun Dun uh, is one of the larger Yukon First Nations, and we share our traditional territory with the Ta'an. Most, if not all, of our um, traditional territories actually overlapped with uh, the other uh, 14 Yukon First Nations throughout the Yukon, but primarily we share it and have a long history with um, Ta'an Kwachin Council. And so as an urban First Nation, we have some unique interests and challenges when we start talking about uh, economic development. And of the 43,000 residents in the Yukon, 25% of them are Indigenous people. Not Yukon First Nations, we have a growing population of Inuit. Uh, we have um, other uh, First Nations throughout Canada that have been married into our communities as well. So just to give you a snapshot of that. Next slide, please. So this, um, Nadia referenced, uh, uh, the vision that was first brought forward to the Government of Canada then um, by um, uh, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. This document, uh, Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow, is uh, essentially the lens that which uh, set the uh, stage for the negotiations for our land claims and resulting self-government agreements for those uh, 11 of the 14 uh, Yukon First Nations that achieved them to date. Next slide, please. So just a quick snapshot, because we do want to get into, for the time that we have limited, to um, just want to make some highlights here for you, and I'll provide this um, presentation to whomever may be interested, so as a source of resource, as you see fit. I uh, just wanted to highlight that timeline from 1973 to 2006, when um, we first started uh, the process to negotiating our land claims and our self-government agreements, up to the time in which the parties finalized uh, a UFA in 1999, or 1990, sorry, and then resulting in the 11 of the 14 finalizing their final and self-government agreements, which were uh, Ta'an, uh, Kwanlun Dun, and then I think lastly, Carcross was the last of the 11 that finalized their self-government and final agreement. Next slide, please. So when we think about economic um, reconciliation, one of the things that stood out is, is, is that um, 
not only is it an important factor to have, but it's also an end goal, and that is self-determination. So uh, when we think about where we're at in the Yukon context, as a result of our final and our self-government agreements, uh, we now see that we can establish um, our own laws, uh, that are reflective of our, of our values and our systems and our customs. We define our own citizenship um, and we have the ability to um, establish our own courts and justice systems. We have access to land uh, through our compensation dollars, which um, many of the uh, nine out of the 11 self-governing First Nations have put in the form of trusts, have been able to grow uh, wealth and establish capital for Yukon First Nations to invest as they see fit. And so um, through those measures, in addition to First Nation corporations, uh, we've been able to move and shift from uh, not being part of the development of Yukon economies to being uh, serious uh, uh, contributors. Next. This is where I need to go to my notes. I have notes. <laughs> I need to stay to the script, Justin. <laughs> because there are some things that I want to uh, I want to share with you. Um, so when we think about Yukon First Nation economies, um, for those of you who are who are familiar with the Yukon um, economy, one of the biggest contributors have been mining, and. Um, Based on research, Yukon has more than 2,700 identified mineral occurrences and excellent geographical, uh, geological potential. The 2018 Fraser Institute Annual Survey of Mining and Exploration gave Yukon a high ranking, third among Canadian jurisdictions, and ninth in the world for investive investment attractiveness. Our history demonstrates that before 1898, First Nation economies consisted of placer mining, copper, the fur trade, uh, for example, 1741, the Hudson Bay to 1986 when uh, they first landed in Fort Yukon. And federal accounts confirm that First Nations controlled and operated the trade routes along the Chilkat through the Chilkoot. In our, more, in our more recent history, we have seen mining represents one of the biggest contributors to our economy through open pit mines, lead, zinc, silver, and lead. In addition, um, so some of you if, um, are probably familiar with the uh, Klondike Gold Rush. Uh, that was just um, an elaboration on the mining and the resource development and which continues to go on uh, in the Yukon. And more recently in work that I've been involved in is, this is the discussion around energy development. And so our history um, in building the Yukon economy right within the heart of the Kwan Dun traditional territory was the construction of the White Horse Dam. And so what was really interesting about that particular development is, is that, as we know, hydro energy uh, supports many developments in industry in Canada and continues to play a major role in ensuring uh, the competitiveness of Canadian economy. It supports industry, commerce, infrastructure, and communities. But in the context of, for example, Kwanlin Dunn and Ta'an and Car Cross Tagish, the construction of the Whitehorse Dam for the purposes of hydro energy had a very deleterious effect on our way of life, uh, resulting in flooding in our lands, and continues to create challenges going forward in terms of um, use of settlement lands due to erosion, things of that nature. So that's our history uh, in terms of some of those key elements of uh, economic drivers uh, in the Yukon. Uh, next slide. When we think about economic development in a self-government uh, context, I want to give you a couple of points of reference. Uh, these are tools what I look to as tools um, to help inform um, economic development. So um, I want to read uh, for you, and I encourage you all, you can actually get this online uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this document. Um, and. Uh, the history of who we are uh, is really reflective in the um, Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow. So what was our history? And the document reads, the phase economic development describes to the Yukon Indian people what we once had, but no longer have. 
In nearly all our communities, the economy is controlled by the whites. They manage the stores, foremen's, mills, own the trucks, and control the tourism and mining industries. What few jobs Indians hold are restricted to laborers. Before 1948, the Yukon Indian people were economically independent. Now over half our families are on welfare, and the number of receiving kind of assistance has been high as 80%. What's the plan going forward? The Yukon Indian people must play an important part in the development of the Yukon if we are to take part in the social, economic, and political life of this country. We must have a solid economic base. We must have a chance to help plan the future of this land if we are going to benefit from its development. And a vision going forward. Um, the Yukon First Nation chiefs at that time stated that if the Government of Canada is sincere about Yukon Indian people participating in the development of the Yukon, then we must become involved before decisions are reached to grant oil leases over large tracts of lands, build a hydro development without compensation to the people affected, allow mining companies to destroy active trap lines without compensation, compensation and allow white populations and developments to unnecessarily pollute our rivers. Those particular points are uh, important because much of what we see in uh, economic development discussions within the circles that I'm involved in, uh, those key elements uh, help to guide how Yukon First Nations want to move forward. Um, and uh, another area of where we can see um, uh, what was the vision for economic development for Yukon First Nations uh, is reflected in uh, Chapter 22 of the um, final agreement, which the objectives of the chapter were to provide Yukon Indian people with opportunities to participate in the Yukon economy, uh, develop economic self-reliance for Yukon Indian people, and to ensure that Yukon Indian people obtain economic benefits that flow directly from their settlement agreements. Next slide. Oh, actually, go back, sorry. Um, so, we know where we've come from. We have an idea where we want to go. We look to Chapter 22 as one of many tools to help formulate what uh, economic future may look like and some milestones. How are we able to do that? So, uh, Yukon First Nation trusts. Um, as I was relaying, nine out of the 11 Yukon First Nations have used compensation monies that they've received under the final agreement and put them into investment trusts. Some Yukon First Nations have also put forward some of those monies um, available under Chapter 22 in business trusts. And the objectives of those trusts are to generate wealth for not only the now, but the future. There's positive duties on governments, First Nation governments particularly, to invest those monies to grow because when we think about land claims, uh, two of the biggest assets um, that we have coming out of our agreements are our lands and our monies. And so um, this is uh, something that we need to take in mind when we're preparing for future generations, uh, seven, ten generations from going forward. Currently, I think uh, we have and see that Yukon First Nation uh, trusts uh, have generated about $350 million. Um, and that money, in part, uh, benefits Yukon. Uh, we've been able to um, enter into meaningful partnerships with uh, development corporations um, to uh, be involved in um, um, development here locally in the Yukon. We've seen um, investments in the Air North airline. Uh, we've seen investments in residential commercial uh, and things of that nature. So uh, as a result of our Yukon First Nation Trust, we've been able to participate not only in private markets, but also in public markets and uh, generate that wealth uh, for our First Nation families and communities. As well, uh, many of our Yukon First Nations have developed um, or have established development corporations, which are very important in those partnerships uh, locally to develop um, uh, commercial residential uh, type of initiatives, land development, things of that nature. There's a Another area, though, I want to touch on that doesn't really stem from our land claims, but 
In part, I think it's because of our land claims that have created the environment for our, our um, Yukon First Nations to reclaim their language, um, to revitalize their way of um, uh, life through um, song and dance uh, uh, as part of their culture and have been able to help stimulate a First Nation economy uh, that is built on uh, their customs, their relationship with their lands. And a big part of that is we see um, NGOs, uh, particularly Yukon First Nation Cultural and Tourism, that have been really instrumental in creating and helping to support that environment for this area of uh, Yukon economy, which is not necessarily a traditional area, uh, traditional way, uh, uh, sorry, a traditional form of our economy, but it's really helped to diversify and it's really helped uh, many of our young Indigenous entrepreneurs uh, who are either providing land-based um, type programming or through uh, beading. Uh, it's become, there's been a renaissance of beading and um, it's just really taken off and it's really helped to sustain uh, many of of our young um, Indigenous people. Next slide, please. But in light of the wealth that we find that we have, you know, Yukon First Nations, we have access to lands and resources and capital. However, there is a gap that um, divides our ability to have that Indigenous prosperity. And part of that gap is, is, is that the need to um, actively invest in our people. Uh, in spite of the, uh, the fact that we have uh, these resources, um, many of us have, uh, you know, First Nations, when we think about the first four who started implementing in 1995, we're still struggling. We're still struggling with issues of poverty, uh, with the working poor, where uh, they're part of the workforce, but the cost of living here in the North is still quite high, uh, dealing with um, issues of addictions, uh, dealing with um, violence in our communities. And it really does impact um, our ability to be uh, active participants in the workforce and help with that part of economic um, uh, stability and um, achieve our aspirations in that area. Other areas where we need to think about um, um, further investment as well is in the public safety in our communities. Um, in particular, uh, we recognize that enhanced economic development, a safe community is also more attractive for a place to live, work and invest. And we appreciate that this can also lead to increased economic activity, job creation and higher property values. But the reality is, is in our communities uh, and work that I do in administration of justice is, is that this is a real um, uh, area of importance. Uh, we need um, attention to be paid for more safer communities, for our mothers and our parents to raise their children uh, in a safe environment so that they're not having to deal with ongoing trauma uh, in order for them to participate in the workforce. Um, and also we need more public safety um, for our Indigenous women and our Two-Spirit in the workforce. Just recently, um, the Yukon um, rolled out their implementation plan for the Yukon Strategy on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And this was a big component in terms of making uh, the work Workforce, particularly for the resource extraction sector uh, to ensure that there are policies that support our Indigenous women and our Two-Spirited uh, to make sure that they're safe when they are participating in that part of our economy. So there is these gaps uh, and it's important that we pay attention to them because um, capital, land and resources is only one part of the equation. Uh, next slide. So as we know, as I went through and I was like, okay, well, what is economic reconciliation? And so research indicates that it's the redress of historical injustice to Indigenous people, but it also strives to achieve economic balance and equality for Indigenous people to redress the fundamental social, political, and financial harm enacted through systemic disempowerment. So 
for us as you come first nation it means improving the living standards for our families um, also for individual economic self-sufficiency um, to be able to have an appreciation of uh, our our history this is um, this is work that we're doing right now on the water relicensing is ensuring that um, as we build economies that our history is reflective accurately as to who we are as Indigenous people and it's to be um, designed and delivered by our own respective lens. And also it's important that Yukon economies be inclusive of First Nations um, and that those uh, initiatives and opportunities reflect uh, Yukon First Nations values values, interests, and priorities as it will affect either their lands, their resources, and or their citizens' well-beings. As well, it's about equity and ownership and partnership. Last slide. So how can you, as policy thinkers, as uh, change makers, make a difference? Um, and I would submit that I think you can be part of the solution by supporting government policies that provide for dedicated First Nation resources for community safety measures. Uh, federally, there's discussions going on with First Nation policing about making uh, First Nation communities a safer place. Here in the Yukon, we're talking about First Nation dedicated policing services because the RCMP services are not enough. We have surgeons of violence and drug trafficking in our communities that are affecting our families, that impact our ability to actively participate in the workforce. Affordable housing and home ownership um, to deal with the reality of the homelessness. We can't participate, we don't have prosperity if our people are still homeless. And so I was encouraged to see an article that came out of the Bank of Canada. Um, it was um, in May of 2022, the Bank of Canada reflected on remarks from the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association uh, that stated that in their effort to improve the living standards to support Indigenous prosperity, the association issued over 46,000 loans worth a total of $2.8 billion in the last three decades, but also recognized that as an institute that they needed to do more. So it's not just governments, right? It's also the banks. It's, it's, there's an opportunity for everyone to contribute to the prosperity and achieve economic reconciliation for Indigenous people in this country. As well, um, I submit that um, as policy change makers to advocate for dedicated long-term core federal funding for organizations that do help to diversify our economy, that are more based on our culture and our identity, um, and to be part of those conversations to be able to uh, change the way Canada and uh, provincial territorial governments look at their own economies, that it's just not the traditional forms of economies. And lastly, to support legislative efforts to advance First Nation principles and values in economic and resource development. Um, we talk about, and this is my last point, is, is that we talk about, uh, you know, economic reconciliation for um, First Nations to be part of a workforce or economic development in its most traditionalist forms, uh, which are governed by federal and or territorial legislation that are based on values that don't reflect who we are as a people or our relationship with the resources around us. And so one of the things that we can do to achieve that economic reconciliation is for First Nations to be able to see themselves in the legislation uh, that governs their lives and that impacts their lands or the well-being of their citizens. And so what we're advocating here uh, with some of the Yukon First Nations that I work with is, is, is that we need to rethink legislation development and I know that we're in the process of mining, develop, um, mining legislation uh, and foreseeably uh, maybe revisiting the Waters Act here in the Yukon uh, to look at at um, principles of reciprocity, you know, in mining and hydro energy, we take from the land. 
but we never give back and we never really understand what we're taking for the purposes of stimulating an economy or feeding consumption of whatever those energy initiatives are. And so if we are genuine about achieving and bridging that relationship and achieving economic reconciliation, it requires a commitment to support and stand alongside First Nations around ensuring that the laws of this country reflect who we are and our principles and our values and that that in effect can encourage us to be equal partners and uh, have equity in the way that we go forward. So I believe, that last slide, I think that is um, all I have to offer. I hope that I've given you something to um, consider and take away and I want to thank you for your time and attention. Konnichiwa. What I want to talk to you about is not only, of course, economic reconciliation, but I want to just start with a little bit of a historical context. Uh, I want to talk about one of the most very important thing uh, when you think about economic reconciliation is ecosystem thinking. Victoria, you touched on that. And then I'll just conclude with some comments that are really germane to economic development and uh, Yukon government's perspective on economic reconciliation. First, it's wonderful to be on uh, Victoria's uh, nation's traditional territory, and of course, many of my friends and brethren from uh, the Tawn Quachin First Nation. In 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada prepared a comprehensive report detailing the ongoing impacts of Canadian residential school system. The 94 calls to action were an outcome of the report and provided direction to all levels of government, the corporate sector, churches, and other organizations and how we take action to address the harm and ongoing impacts of residential school system on survivors and families and their communities. Over the span of more than a century, it's estimated that approximately 150,000 Indigenous children were separated from their families and forced to attend one of 139 residential schools across Canada. Residential schools and day schools have had a long lasting effect on Indigenous people in the Yukon. Six residential schools operate in the Yukon between 1903 and 1985. I understand that you were in my traditional territory yesterday. Uh, there was a Chutless school in Carcross, the, Co the Codert Hall, Yukon Hall, uh, Whitehorse Baptist Missionary School in Whitehorse, the Shingle Point School in Shingle Point on Yukon's Arctic Coast, and St. Paul School, St. Paul Hostel in Dawson. Additionally, the Yukon First Nation students attended the Lower Post School in Northern British Columbia. Addressing the harms caused by residential school and colonial policies is a key, is a, uh, is a key priority for the government of Yukon. Close collaboration with Yukon First Nation governments is an integral component of the path forward. Our last report on the calls to action was established in 2016. We are taking this opportunity in 2023, the 50th anniversary of presentation of Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow, and the 30th anniversary of the signing of the Umbrella Land Claims Agreement, to reflect on our progress towards the goal set out by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I want to talk about some of the other areas. One of these things that we went out years ago we went, went out to something called Penwar, which is the Pacific Northwest Economic Region that includes a number of states down the West Coast uh, and the North and Alberta and some of the Prairie Provinces. And at the time, there was a keynote speech from the president of Microsoft. Uh, it's a, I don't know, oh, it's a gentleman, it wasn't Bill Gates, it was actually a president, it was another gentleman. And he was talking about trying to create this uh, diversification in your economy. And what they did is they measured a number of different cities and basically compared them. So you had the ones you would think about. You would think about uh, uh, like Silicon Valley or you'd think about Tokyo or you would think about some of these other big areas with lots of capital. And at the end of this, all the mayors, all the senators, all the politicians always went up to this gentleman and said, when you looked at these 13 different factors, we can't do it all. We can only do one or two or three. And they'd always ask him, which one would that be? And this is really about the economic, trying to build your, your uh, economy up. And his answer was always the same. He said, if you only pick one, it's always education. It's all, you always have to start there. If you're trying to build a knowledge economy, you know, obviously being in the university is wonderful, but if you do not have the kind of programming for your young people, you probably won't get that diversification place. So it's really interesting hearing that from the head of uh, Microsoft. And so very important in our ecosystem thinking on economic reconciliation uh, is the wellness, the well-being of all of our citizens. 
and today I'll focus more on Yukon's perspective of uh, our uh, very important partnerships with Yukon First Nations. On the child welfare front, these are some of the activities that we uh, were undergoing. Uh, they really actually speak to uh, us addressing the truth and reconciliation. I won't get into quoting all the numbers. It's not an exhaustive list, there's more, but these are some of the very important ones. We've amended the Child and Family Act to create a Child and Family Service Act Steering Committee with the Council of Yukon First Nations and Yukon First Nations. What we're trying to do is improve access to cultural activities and establish cultural plans for all children. Uh, Yukon First Nation children, of course, other Yukoners who aren't Indigenous. We established the Yukon First Nation Cultural Connections Project. This is develop cultural parenting programs to support Yukon First Nation families. All children, service and staff involved in frontline uh, complete trauma-informed and trauma response core training to focus on understanding the underlying trauma affecting children, including residential school uh, effects. In education, this is something that's new. Uh, Victoria, you probably had a role in this somehow. In 2022, Yukon First Nations School Board was created with the Chiefs Committee on Education. This is very momentous. These are the school boards that govern much of the schools and provide uh, you know, support and a direction and advice on curriculum development. Very important as First Nations look at creating worldview in the Yukon education system. We also have deep collaboration with Yukon First Nations and things like the Yukon Forum, uh, Yukon Native Education Center, First Nation Education Commission, and of course the Chiefs Commission, our Committee on Education. The Yukon Forum is kind of unique, I think, in some respects. Years ago, I went to Washington, D.C., and when the administration comes in, uh, in their form of Indian Affairs Department, I think as of Indian Affairs, I think it is, uh, they have this big auditorium, and at the start of the administration, the President of the United States and his cabinet meet all of the tribal chiefs across the states. They all come there for one time to meet the new administration in this auditorium. Here in the Yukon, the Yukon Forum, uh, three times a year, all of the chiefs get together with all the Premier and all the cabinet to talk on all priorities. It's a lot of collaboration, a lot of decision on how the governments will cooperate across a number of files of mutual um, interest and mutual um, importance. Uh, we'll be off on the road in the next few days here going to Dawson to the next Yukon Forum. Another piece is curriculum. Uh, we finalized Yukon First Nation Education Collaboration Framework. This is a framework that's uh, providing the direction and advice to build curriculum that's culturally appropriate. Some of the pieces that have come from this are, for example, ancestral technology, youth for dignity, Yukon First Nation leadership, Yukon First Nation studies, Yukon First Nation languages, something called the Indigenous Academy, which is actually in partnership with your First Nation. I know this is a list of things, but just the general sense is there has been a lot of you know, effort and the real importance towards this. On the health front, very critical. We're working with Yukon First Nation to explore ways of providing more culturally safe and respectful care. Yukon First Nation Wellness Consultant focuses on developing a cultural wellness strategy. For example, there's support for Jackson Lake Healing Camp. This is in this area. There's one in the north with the Trondike-Gwich'in First Nation. Continuing care to develop First Nation Advisory Committee to explore policy changes to achieve more culturally safe and respectful care. We have a cultural competency program. All of our frontline workers are uh, going, through pro going through training around humility and cultural safety practices. And we have the breaking trail. As Victoria mentioned, 25% of Yukon is indigenous. Within the agreements, we also are always striving to achieve a representative public service of 25%. Ideally, we'd like to uh, be, have a higher representation of Indigenous people. Uh, it's, a, it's a preferential hiring process. So if an Indigenous people who applied for the jobs are certified, they will be offered the job first. Waiting for Victoria to apply. Yeah, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> on the justice front, we have an integrated restorative justice unit. It's a one-window approach which aims to increase the use of, of diversion and restorative justice practices in Yukon. Uh, Car Cross has been one that's been on the lead of uh, restorative justice with healing circles. I don't know if that, you heard about that yesterday. The Justice Wellness Center, it's a wraparound service delivered by a model to provide integrated treatment and indigenous programming to addressing underlying criminal behavior. Uh, with CYFN, the Council of Yukon First Nations, uh, we administer a GLADU uh, writing uh, program, which allows inmates and people who are in the prison system to advocate on their own behalf 
but also play a role in writing their own GLADI reports. We have indigenous court worker program, which I think is probably familiar for folks around the country. Uh, and of course, as, as Victoria mentioned, uh, Yukon's MMI G2S Plus strategy, changing the story of upholding dignity and Yukon's uh, strategic direct, you're gonna say something. I thought you were going to go there, but, and there's, well, I didn't. Another important piece, which is uh, coming from the agreements, and Victoria has been integral on this, so has her, uh, Dave Joe, is looking at the administration of justice, which is a First Nation drawing down one of their lawmaking powers, and ultimately to set courts and look at indigenous law applying to their citizens. So it's probably quite, quite an edge in this country, I assume, in, in, that, uh, in that front. What I'll get into a little bit now is just more directly into economic reconciliation. Um, some of it, I think you've heard quite a few times, but I won't be too long on this. As I'm sure you're aware, the Yukon has a unique political landscape in which we share governance responsibilities with 14 First Nation governments. Of these 14, 11 are Yukon First Nations have self-government final agreements or modern treaties that were signed between 1993 and 2005. The self-government agreements establish key mechanisms for cooperation in areas of wildlife management, land use planning, and the assessment of development projects. What's important to remember is that whether we have a treaty or not, all Yukon First Nations play a key role in our traditional economy. Almost every Yukon First Nations has a development corporation, and many critical businesses in the Yukon are run by investments from these corporations. For example, it's through partnership with Yukon First Nation Development Corporations, we've been able to bring cell service to every Yukon community and radically change the cost of air transportation in the north. I'm going to take a moment to give you an economic overview of the Yukon, and then we'll get further into our partnerships with First Nations. The Yukon has a diverse business community and a strength in our sectors that has led our economy to be one of the fastest growing in Canada. Data from Statistics Canada indicate that Yukon's real GDP grew by 10% in 2021, double Canada's growth to 5% in that same period. And the Conference Board of Canada predicts that continued strong growth in our GDP through 2023. The Yukon also boasts one of the lowest unemployment rates in Canada, averaging 3.7% in 2022. There are many jobs available uh, to 1,320 in December 2022 for a 6% job vacancy rate. The average wage offered for these jobs is close to $24 per hour. Average weekly earnings are up and retail sales are strong and rising. Preliminary numbers for the 2022 show that Yukon-wide retail sales of over $1 billion to the first time of nearly 17% over 2021. I mean, that's, to me, amazing. A billion dollars was spent in retail in this little territory. Wow. We're an attractive destination for those looking to live and work in a unique environment. Our population continues to grow, reaching a new high of almost 40,000 last summer. In this context, we are working towards economic reconciliation through the funding for First Nation small businesses and collaboration with Yukon First Nation Investment and development corporations. Across the Yukon government, we are working with Yukon First Nations to address harms caused by long history of inequity and discrimination uh, and to achieve a meaningful change in tangible benefits for all Yukoners through collaboration on a range of environmental, social, and economic projects. Participation and equity in the development, procurement, and business sectors is key to Yukon First Nations advancing and succeeding. One of the most significant ways we are enhancing economic outcomes for Yukon First Nation citizens and businesses is through the Yukon First Nation procurement policy. This policy has provided opportunities for Yukon First Nations people and businesses to be active partners in the economy. The policy position the Yukon government as a trailblazer in Indigenous procurement has been widely praised as a model for other jurisdictions. It has opened the door for larger conversations between governments, First Nations and industry and how we ensure that government procurement benefits everyone. The policy is a positive step towards advancing reconciliation and has been done in collaboration with Yukon First Nation partners every step of the way. It has been more than three years since the policy was implemented and Yukon is still ahead of other jurisdictions when it comes to commitments and actions on Indigenous procurement. This is an example of the type of bold leadership required to acknowledge the injustices of the past and commit to doing better moving forward. Other provinces and territories and even the federal government have been looking to the Yukon to understand how they can leverage our experience to advance their own journeys towards reconciliation. Yukon, Yukon First Nation procurement policy includes many components, including the Yukon First Nation Business Registry. On December 1st, 2021, 
verified Yukon First Nations uh, started to be on the list of the registry. Over 100 verified Yukon First Nation businesses are now listed, making it easier for purchasers and businesses to find and connect. To be listed on the registry, the business must meet the definition of a Yukon First Nation businesses and be verified as such. This is an ongoing process that we continue to work with our partners to provide, to, to refine. Bid value reductions and other methods by which we level the playing field. Workforce development is the final way in which Yukon First Nation procurement policy works to support Yukon First Nation citizens and businesses. We are, we are supplying funding for our First Nation workforce development program to support and enhance the implementation of the policy. It is important that this initiative is led by Yukon First Nations. The Council of Yukon First Nations has taken the lead on getting the First Nation citizen and businesses engaged with this program. And Peter back there, Peter Turner back there has been really involved in that over the years. As you can see, the policy has been a major shift in our procurement system and is a tangible commitment to reconciliation. We also work closely with our First Nation partners in the mining sector. This is the largest contributor to GDP and is vital to our territory's ongoing economic development. It is essential that mining projects in the Yukon engage with, with affected First Nations people and governments. Critical minerals projects have the potential to provide long-lasting economic benefit to communities through employment, royalties, and infrastructure. Supporting a healthy and active mineral sector will allow the Yukon to continue its economic upswing. This said, we must balance the economic opportunities with the other mining. With, we must balance the economic opportunities with our mining sector presents with responsible social and environmental measures necessary to sustain it. We must ensure that the environment is protected with Yukon First Nation interests and rights are respected. We're working on a number of initiatives that aim to clarify our regulatory system and ensure that mining is conducted responsibly. Mineral explanation has a long has been a key component to Yukon's economic success and the skilled services of our Yukon First Nation businesses at the heart of this sector. For example, we are committed to ensuring the project's benefit are being realized by Yukon First Nations and communities from the Mayo Mine Remediation Project, a long-term effort led by the Government of Canada. For instance, Ross River Denny Council Development Corporation, uh, De Dena, Dena Dezidi, provides goods and services to the state, to the site, which includes involvement in revegetation and environmental monitoring programs. We also have a shared dedication to a collaborative approach. The government of Yukon, in partnership with Yukon First Nations and Transboundary First Nations, is developing new mineral legislation, as you were talking about, Victoria, uh, which is underway. The new legislation will address every stage of the life mining cycle, from prospecting to the operation of a mine to the eventual closure of remediation of a site. The aim of the new legislation is to improve the management of Yukon mineral resources in a way that protects the environment, respecting First Nations and Yukon's relationship with the land, and supporting the competitive and responsible mining industry. We recently held a public engagement on the approaches and we're considering feedback collected uh, collected will be used by Yukon government. First Nations and transboundary First Nations as they continue to develop the legislation. First Nation governments have been involved in the development of the new mineral le legislation since this began. First Nation consultation was carried out at the same time as the public engagement in the spring. New mineral legislation will help ensure the industry operates in a responsible fashion. The environment and ensure the environment is protected, First Nation rights are respected, and the cleanup costs are not entirely borne by the public purse. By working together, we are building a cleaner and a greener economy while bringing, while bringing benefits to the communities. We are also now looking at partnerships with First Nations that will support clean energy. The Yukon government is committed to supporting the development of cost-effective renewable energy projects in a way that fulfills treaty obligations promotes reconciliation and provides energy security for the Yukon. Our government has taken a new collaborative approach to working with uh, Yukon First Nation governments during the assessment and licensing of energy projects, an ongoing basis throughout the operation. Working with Indigenous governments on energy projects and production is, is fundamental to meeting Yukon climate change and energy goals. Our government is working with the Champagne Ajac First Nation and the Yukon Energy Corporation to implement agreements signed in 2022, which established a collaborative relationship that will allow us to advance shared priorities on the Ajac Lake area over the long term. We're also proud to work with Kwan Dun First Nation, Victoria's Nation Development Corporation, Chu Ni Kwan on the Hakka Hill Wind Project. 
The project saw four wind turbines installed on the top of Heckle Hill, just west of here in Whitehurst. I think if you step outside, you can see them. Uh, they're expected to start feeding into the grid later this fall. Negotiations are underway with Carcross Tags First Nation, Kwan Dunn, the Tong Quashin Council, regarding the Whitehorse Rapid Generating Station uh, and the First Nation of Nationalic Dunn regarding the Mayo Generating Station, as Victoria was talking about uh, water relicensing. We're also at the preliminary stages of exploring a grid connection with BC. If the concept proves to be feasible, partnership with First Nation will be critical to the success of such a connection. Our government will ensure the discussions regarding these and any other future energy projects will include consideration of the rights, interests and potential involvement affected First Nations and transboundary Indigenous governments and groups. We are offering funding for renewable energy projects throughout the government of Yukon Innovative Renewable Energy Fund. Victoria there used to run the fund before she moved over to the housing. To date, the government of Yukon has provided $7.9 million in funding to First Nation governments, municipalities, community organizations and Yukon businesses for the renewable energy projects. There's additional funding available for renewable energy generating projects under the Government of Canada's Arctic Energy Fund. It's a fund that we actually co-administer uh, in Canada's invest infrastructure programs. Today, Yukon-based renewable energy projects have $40.8 million in federal funding, including energy generation infrastructure such as the battery and transmission lines. We're also actually investing in infrastructure, an essential factor in sustainable mineral development. To do this, we're working closely with Ottawa and government to government based with Yukon First Nations. For example, the Yukon Resource Gateway Program will support upgrades to 650 kilometers of road worth 467 million in the areas of high mineral potential and includes six agreements with Yukon First Nation governments and supports 11 project components. These investments in strategic infrastructure can enable projects in the Yukon that can supply a stable and secure source of critical minerals. Because of our robust critical mineral deposits, we're well positioned to contribute to the ongoing global shift to a greener economy. The government of Yukon is committed to having project agreements with all Yukon First Nations and traditional territory affected by the Resource Gateway Program. These agreements are designed to support meaningful and beneficial uh, participation by Yukon First Nations in the program. To date, six Yukon uh, Resource Gateway projects have been signed. Our government has also signed a project charter with the Tesla and Clinton Council for the Sutland Bay uh, Bridge Replacement. It's a large bridge in one of the communities that's been replaced. The project charter supports collaboration between the, the First Nation and the government of Yukon for delivery of economic benefits to the Tesla and Clinton Council citizens throughout the project's duration. I'd like to briefly speak about our ongoing work on the Dempster Fiber Project. It's a fiber that's connecting us, ultimately creating redundancy for the North. We continue to engage with Yukon First Nations and Indigenous groups to ensure the success of the project. We regularly meet to make sure that economic opportunities arising from the project are made available to local businesses and citizens. These are just a few of the major projects which are collaborating with Yukon First Nations to improve infrastructure and economic outcomes. As we continue on our economic journey, rather than just consulting First Nations and projects or plans designed unilaterally by the government of Yukon, we're increasingly doing co-developing significant or larger scale projects with First Nations from the onset. After all, reconciliation is an ongoing journey a shared responsibility of all governments and individuals in society. The Yukon government is deeply committed to continuing this journey through collaboration and partnership with First Nation governments. While there's still more work to do, we're seeing that these efforts are resulting in meaningful change, creating better programs and services to all Yukoners. Collaboration drives our whole society towards greater prosperity. I want to once again thank uh, Yukon University, of course, Action Canada, and I would be remiss not to conclude, uh, I didn't know at the start, what a great honor it is, because Sarah, of course, was a close friend of mine also, just to be able to speak on a day that's dedicated, or at least a, uh, a session dedicated to her, is truly a great honor. Thank you.